I had him do five things, sleep, drink water, supplements, uh, and work out. I mean, these are all basically things that you could do. You think, you know, we can all do it, mm -hmm. plus or minus. And I had, um, with the help of a friend who they crunched my data well, with SPSS, it turned out that sleep was the most important thing. So in order for us to regulate our central nervous system, what we can do is we can we can pay attention to our sleep. And I know, you know, if you're stressed out, usually what you do, you want to stay up, you like you do all the opposite opposite things things than you know going to sleep. Welcome to Good Enough with the Trauma Therapist, a podcast dedicated to empowering you to take control of your life learning valuable strategies for healing and looking at mental health through a trauma-informed lens. Get ready to feel empowered and confident in managing your symptoms. And now, here is your host, licensed clinical social worker, EMDR therapist, and certified clinical trauma professional, Jamie Vollmuller. Today, I have Dr. Barger Shork, who is the founder and CEO of Clear Intentions International. She has coached hundreds of individuals and corporate teams around the world, and she is here to help you get unstuck, overcome your fears, and leave the past in the past. In other words, live the most amazing life you ever dreamed of. Using her proprietary coaching technique called narrow emotional coaching, Dr. Barbara will assist in rewiring your brain so you can can make room to confidently manifest your dreams, goals, and aspirations. Dr. B, thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Can we just jump right into um, your proprietary coaching technique? Yeah, sure. It's, <laughs> it's one of the things I, I love, love, love it's to do. And uh, in, in full disclosure, I um, had somebody work with me for a few years. Mm -hmm. And then I took the tool and just added it with coaching and neuroscience and uh, expanded it and uh, um, trademarked it. And that's how we have neuroemotional coaching. So awesome. can I give you an overview? Yeah, I would love an overview. I'm so like, we love trauma here. So it's like any new techniques that we can learn from our friends across the world. That's amazing. Would love to hear it. We're back. I think we're a little uh, laggy. We were laggy for a minute because sometimes that happens that the it just goes down for a minute. So let me give you an overview. Okay. Uh, neuroemotional coaching, the whole purpose of neuroemotional coaching is to go into the deeper layers of our consciousness, the subconscious and the unconscious. Because what we knew, know from neuroscience is that when we want to change neuroplasticity, which is sort of jargon for, I want to be able to do things faster and get to, to move myself out of the comfort zone, mm -hmm. uh, we need to look at the beliefs that keep our ways of being and our stuckness in place. Because I can intellectually say to myself, you know, it's safe to get in the elevator or take that snake or, you know... It's okay to go out and make a million dollars or, yeah, I have that baby. But then our, you know, reptilian, the fight, flight, or freeze of pawn will come in and, and tell us otherwise. So with neuroemotional coaching, I use muscle testing, kinesiology to find out what your reality is. Then I go through a 15-step propriety technique. And then at the end, we have identified the now, the block that you experience now with the origin the pattern of where that came from and then we've done something to change your you know your nurse your um, neurons mm -hmm. and the receptors to have a different response in the brain yeah so it's it's rewiring your brain so that totally. the, the responses that we want to have happen more quickly and are easier for our brains to be like not afraid of <laughs> Right. And, right, and those other things start to fade away. That's right, but it's not just fading away; it, they become neutral. So, mm. if you had a, you know, I have somebody that came to me recently because there there was a family member that was triggering them. So, it's not just to have a coping mechanism; it's to actually look at that person and not get triggered. 
So it's like you look at them and you go, okay, it's not about forgetting. It's about having a different chemical response in your brain that then will produce a different emotion because I'm not interested in uh, putting a Band-Aid over or, you know, dressing up the wound. I actually want that to be a stepping stone or a launch pad for something else. Yeah. So, so my practice is a lot of eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. So I'm, I'm familiar with these concepts, but so it sounds like, um, not only are we working on, you know, moving that flight or fright response and, and that trigger to a different portion of our brain. So it's not so strongly pinged, but then you guys are also working on like reinforcing the the positive beliefs, I would assume, that's opposite of that core belief that's keeping us stuck. Yeah, sure. So once we have that space in your consciousness, in the brain, and then we're going to implant something, you know, you're going to implant something new. What I, so I'm, you know, I'm familiar with EMDR. And um, I was talking to somebody about it last night that if you had seizures, you know, then EMDR is, is something that's actually not recommended. And I happened to have seizures when I was 15 and 16. So when it came to, to uh, we had somebody that came to to teach us or to you know, talk to us all about EMDR. And I'm like, you know, I, I'm not a candidate because yeah. I can't do it. So, and the wonderful thing about kinesiology is, is that when the body feels overloaded and says, this is too traumatic or I don't want to go there, then the body will shut down and won't allow you uh, to do it because uh, it it has that wisdom to say today's not our day or I I don't feel well or I'm sick or so it's yeah. it's good but yeah I I would say new emotional coaching and EMDR are sort of like kissing cousins kissing like like that and brain spotting we all just all those brain based modalities it's like how do we rewire so that we can feel in our bodies better not just logically know that these things are all irrational in our brains right. So, okay. Um, I also, I really wanted to talk to you about um, what is going on in your country right now and like the impact of uh, intergenerational trauma is something that you're very passionate about. Um, So we want to keep it broad because we don't want to offend anyone or get political, but just what are the, what are some of the, the things that you're seeing there that are signs that this is you know, having an impact on, obviously, the, the people of Israel. Well, so, yeah. So, for those of you who don't know, I live in Israel. And, um, gosh, where do I start? So, I, I mean, Israel is a country where, where there's a lot of PTSD to begin with. Because, um, you know, the state of Israel was founded uh, after World War II, and a lot of Holocaust survivors... Uh, came to Israel. And so, I mean, we don't need to uh, talk about how traumatic their experience was. And then these people had second and third and fourth, you know, generations. So there's a lot of uh, trauma already present. Mm -hmm. And um, so on top of that, we're now experiencing trauma in that uh, people that um, are seeing things on TV are getting re-triggered. Uh, because maybe they never had the opportunity to do trauma work. So yeah. I had people come to me who had been raped in the past, who are watching these videos or these these scenes on TV or people that have been, um, you know, that have had other traumas. And maybe it wasn't necessarily war-related. It could just be domestic, you yeah. know, where there's, um, you know, spousal, spousal abuse, so yeah. I, we're seeing a lot of that now, uh, and then in general, what 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 we're seeing here is there's there's a lot. People are very stressed. You can see it by the way they're driving. You can see it the way they respond uh, in conversations. People are super anxious, uh, and you know I can tell you myself, I'm anxious because you know I've been now in the you know the sirens have gone off uh, so many times, and this experience of having to go into a bunker. Uh, even though mathematical, the chances of you actually uh, getting hit are very, very small because, thank God, Israel as I know, um, is is traumatizing. And when I hear, I, I was in Germany a couple weeks ago, and mm-hmm. I was in a in a building uh, in a store that was in a basement, 
and, and above us was like a trolley. Uh, and every minute or so, the trolley would go by and the whole building would shake. And I'm like, after about two minutes of that, I had to go out. I had to get out because for me, it was that sensation of I'm in the bunker. And when you, mm-hmm. when you hear it, it's incredibly loud. So, uh, you know, everybody's going to have, and depending on where you are, some people are still misplaced. They haven't been able to go home. And yesterday I was talking to somebody and um, their child is in the army and they've lost many, many, many people. Um, so, and it, for me, it's like, it's, it's tr- the trauma is everywhere. Uh, and, yeah. and for the extent of that, people have um, not healed from their old trauma. They, it's being reinforced. If they haven't really been traumatized, then they're definitely being traumatized now. And uh, uh, it it impacts our day-to-day. So, And future generations to come. And I, I think where you started with everyone that's, you know, uh, the, the Jews that came to Israel came there after a tragedy, right, where they all experienced significant trauma. And there are studies that show that I believe there's even studies on that ho- those Holocaust survivors and yes. um, descendants of Jews that were not descendants of Holocaust survivors and the difference in their uh, brain chemistry and yep. um, all of that. And and it just shows that like, yeah, those generations that are there, they're already like predisposed to be wired on high alert. And then of we course. add all of these compounding stresses and the fact that, you know, um, I'm not sure how easy mental health, how how accessible is mental health where you are right now, Dr. Bay? Uh, I don't know. It's like, I don't know how accessible it is actually. Can, I can't. Can't speak to that. I can't That's, speak to that. Okay. <laughs> In the U.S., it it's can be very, very difficult to find people that can treat you for uh, mental health diagnoses that take your insurance and are affordable and all of that jazz. So I know it's a problem here. It's generally usually a problem a problem <laughs> well they, you know there are a lot of people that volunteered and um here's actually probably way way easier than in the u.s mm. because people understand about ptsd and um and they know the impact that it has on 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 the soldiers on on the family so it's so uh, there's a different awareness so yeah. it, it's easier than in the u.s for sure but still it's like i can't I, you know, I don't want to say always. Oh, it, it, I, I gotcha. I gotcha. Um, if you, <laughs> so for those of us that are still living in chronic stress, um, how how do we work to uh, mitigate the damage of that? Because obviously, like for people living in Israel or, or some women in domestic violence situations, or there are plenty of chronic stress situations that we don't necessarily have the freedom or control to get out of. So uh, do you have any advice for people living in that chronic stress of what they can do to help regulate their nervous systems so that it has less of a profound impact on their day-to-day functioning? Yes, I do. And uh, I I say this is a little bit of a catch-22 because usually the strategies that we have are always or often also difficult to implement. So mm-hmm. I have my I have a PhD in uh, actually it's not a PhD it's, a, it's called a DSS a, a doctoral in, in spiritual science mm-hmm. and in the middle of my um, my research I had a I had you know I had to design something uh, where I uh, asked uh, people to help me identify what would make them feel more comfortable in their own skin uh, and not necessarily as a more relaxed more comfortable in your own skin and I had them do five things sleep drink water supplements, uh, and work out. I mean, these are all basically things that you could do. You think, you know, we can all do it, mm-hmm. plus or minus. And I had, um, with the help of a friend who they crunched my data well, with SPSS, it turned out that sleep was the most important thing. So mm-hmm. in order for us to regulate our central nervous system, what we can do is we can, we can pay attention to our sleep. And I know, you know, if you're stressed out, usually what you do, you want to stay up. You like you do all the opposite, opposite things, things than you know going to sleep. Mm. And um, I'm going to put a plug in, even though you know I'm not getting paid for it. So I I took a sleep course with uh, the sleep doctor, and it was a it was a 30 day course. And he has uh, if you go to thesleepdoctor.com, there's a lot of free materials available. So I did I did an analysis of 
you know, what kind of sleep I am. And then basically it was, you know, got information of when do I need to go to bed? When do I need to get up? What do I need to do? And I was surprised to understand that it's, you know, that I should go to bed like 1130 at night and I should get up at 630 in the morning and, you know, and get outside and do these kind of activities in order to keep my circadian rhythms. And although I had a lot of this information, um, it really helped me. So number one is to have good sleep hygiene. Just because people, you know, we, we generally say, oh, eight hours, you should be sleeping eight hours and you should go to bed before 12. It's like, no, mm -mm. you know, it really depends on who you are. And you can slowly, um, you know, improve with, you know, things like uh, don't be on the screens and, uh, you know, watch what you eat when you eat and all those kind of things. So that's number one. And with that comes all the, the other things that help our reptilian system be calm, like water, you know, it's like making sure that our electrolytes are good. And, and, and if you don't have money and you can't buy yourself electrolytes, you know, a pinch of salt will do. A pinch of little Himalayan salt. So those are some basics. And we know that intuitively, but often when we are in that kind of really, really stressful situations, we're very destructive and we don't want to do it. So sleeping, drinking water, being able to go outside, uh, you know, to get some sunshine, to get some fresh air. Those are some things of where your reptilian system will calm down. Mm -hmm. And then the urge to trigger the fight, flight, or freeze or fawn will be less so because it's like, okay, I'm okay. So that's one. Like on an emotional level, uh, things that we can do, and we, we, all, we, you know, we talk about this all the time. It's like, this catchphrase mindfulness you mm. know what does that really mean it it, it helps to our uh sympathetic ne ne nervous system and then our parasympathetic to calm down so you know just to take some a moment maybe to observe something or to maybe journal a little bit mm. or to um you know to listen to something and just find out how you can become a little bit more still and so that your body can calm down um i'm going to say two more things and then then I'm going to let you talk. Uh, I've also started to do something like intermittent fasting. Mm. And I'm a big fan of it. Uh, and I, I I did it like, I don't know, six months ago. And I, was, I, I didn't do such a good job. And again, uh, I took a course on it. And I learned how to really do it. Because uh, I knew enough to be dangerous. But I didn't know, Jamie, I didn't know enough how to really do it well so it could be successful. So um, to give the body some rest, because if we're constantly eating, then the body's constantly working. And last but not least, and this is my favorite thing to tell people, I got this from my spiritual teacher, something called freeform writing. You sit down with a piece of paper and a pen, you take half hour, and you write down all your thoughts, all your emotions, everything that comes to you in that moment. And when you're done with it, and you've made this agreement beforehand, you take that piece of paper and you burn it. And there's mm. two reasons for it. One reason is when you know that you're going to burn it, nobody can read it. You're going to go a little deeper. And also it's a purification. And so that mm. you take the emotions, wherever they come from, you get them up, 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 and then you get them out and then you release them from your energy field. Yeah, I, I've had clients do that before, especially okay. with emotional. Yeah, it's like a cathartic release of like, I can release this. Now. That's um, right. But I, I, I think all of those are probably things that I've talked about <laughs> with my clients. But sleep, I want to say, is the, the most pushback I get with people is around sleep because they they always say, I don't have time. How am I supposed to sleep? I have all these worries. I can't sleep. <laughs> um, but it is it, it's such a crucial piece um and i i think you know my understanding right, our bodies if uh, if we're not able to rest like the the purpose of you know the sleep the meditation um all, all of these things to basically you're talking about like taking care of yourself and addressing how you're feeling and what's coming up for you right it when we are able to be still enough to do that, it lets our brains know that there's no active threat going on. And right. when we're we're still jumping from thing to thing and staying in that high alert cycle, we we can never you, you can't get out. You're not sh turning the switch off of right? Yeah, exactly. Totally. We're always on. It's like the engine is always running. 
and we're never telling the body, hey, you can, you know, you can chill. So, but, but with sleep, like I, you know, I, when I took this quiz, I found out I only need to sleep six hours, six, six hours, you know, that's, uh, that's achievable. Um, so I encourage people, you know, find out because maybe your inclination is right and maybe you sleep too much or, you know, you're putting it, trying to put yourself into some sort of framework that's not really yours. Yeah. One of the things I did learn is like, stay consistent, mm. do the same thing. So if, if you're only getting five hours or whatever it is to stay consistent, go to bed yeah. at the same time and go to, you know, get up at the same time. But yeah, I mean, we are human beings and sometimes it's really difficult to, for us to um, to kick ourselves in the butt uh, and to inspire ourselves to change. Yeah. Um, but and- I think that mindfulness piece is also really important because that's, that's what teaches you to be still. And most of my clients that struggle with sleep really struggle yeah. with with mindfulness, right? They struggle with being in the present moment. They're worried about what happened during the day or what's happening tomorrow. And and they're not able to really just sit and, and be present from a, for a neuroscience perspective, Dr. B, since that's your jam, what, how does that help us? When 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 we're quiet? Yeah. When, when we're just being in the present moment, when we're just paying attention to what's happening in our body, what's happening, you know, what the sensations we're feeling, the thoughts that we're having, like when we're just present in a moment, what effect does that have on our you know, nervous system regulation from a nerve neuroscience perspective? So the, your parasympathetic just calms down. And basically what happens then is that um, your reptilian blood brain is calm. It doesn't have to act, you know, be activated. So, you know, that's really the simplest way to say. So the lion can go and say, hey, okay, I can take a snoozy. I I don't need to be sitting at the door constantly watching what's happening. Yeah. Uh, And that's really what we want. And, you know, it's like mindfulness can be so many different things. So it doesn't mean you sit in a lotus position and you go, um, you know, for like, I don't know, 45 minutes. One of the ways that I teach my people to be mindful is a listening exercise. And the listening exercise is a way to get you present. Uh, and when you do it, it's like you have no choice, but you're automatically present. And um, so there's, you know, there's little tricks like that that you can use with yourself and then sort of come in the back door. Uh, and oftentimes people say, oh, you know, I just have to find the right way for me to trick myself into mindfulness. And then once I have a positive experience of it, I tell people, it's like, remember that. Yeah. Remember the positive experience that you had and then build upon that. And then maybe you take it to the next level and maybe someday, you you know, you are sitting in the lotus position, but I don't think it's everybody's thing. And like, I remember a long time ago, I was like, you know, I had problems with my, you know, I wanted my meditation practice to be better. And I asked my spiritual teacher and they're like, you need to run first. You have to burn off some energy. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that totally makes sense. So you run and then you do your meditation. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, for me, as I, I have always had ADHD, I have always had sensory issues. Okay. So yeah, like sitting still, it was very hard for me when I started, first started practicing mindfulness. And one of the things that helped me was actually going into nature because it's so more, much more of an immersive experience that I could feel the breeze. I can, I could hear more things, you know, like it wasn't absolutely silent and all of the sensory data around me actually helped me feel more grounded and calm than just the silence. Because to me, silence always meant something bad is going to happen. So my nervous system had a really hard time with that. Right. Just moving that location to somewhere that was like a lot of sensory input was still mindfulness and like very, very peaceful and calming. Um, But it wasn't this idea of like, I'm going to lay there and ohm and sit entirely still and not have any thoughts because I I, I wasn't, my brain isn't wired that way. It's not an easy, it, it can be eventually, but it wasn't the easiest starting place for me. Well, I think you have a really good point because for some people that's not in a safe experience. Yeah. To be quiet and not to be moving, you know, is actually something that they register inside themselves as very dangerous, mm-hmm. right? And so 
maybe you need to walk or maybe you need to be, like you said, in nature in order to slowly let the body know it's safe, it's safe, safe to slow down. Like, you know, being a workaholic, mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, it's completely socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. And people applaud you for constantly being and moving and doing all those things. Yep. And it's just a, you know, it's just a fight, flight, or, you know. Freeze response. Yeah, freeze no, it's, and it's a trauma response. response. It's a trauma response, you yeah. know, to be constantly in movement. And like, and so many people do it. And uh, and the baby boomers are, bar you know, it's built on that. And, you know, all the baby boomers went through trauma. So what do we do? We do a lot of things. So absolutely, you got to find your way. You got to realize what is going on. What are my trauma responses? And then, you know, take a, take a look and see um, what works best. What's the gentlest approach? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that is important because I, I feel like so many people when they're first, t the, the teachings of mindfulness are often that like, be, be still. And I find that I, I work with a lot of CPTSD clients that were like, mm -hmm. quiet stillness doesn't feel good in my body. <laughs> I'm like yeah we gotta we gotta try some other things but there's so many other ways to be mindful like you said um you know you can you can walk you can do mindful eating you can do you know just mindful like i i used to crochet and mm -hmm. i used to like really like it, that was almost a mindfulness activity for me because oh, it was totally. just this, this repetitive motion that just felt calming but it felt more calming than sitting there to just fiddle with my hands and that's again oh. probably because sitting still doesn't feel good in my body <laughs> well i think that's a very you know a lot of you know a lot of people if you think about history they were always crocheting mm -hmm. or needlepoint or something like that you know it's a you know spinning it was a way to calm themselves down it's a self-soothing activity yeah, sure. I feel like that's been replaced with uh, cell phones, which is just highly addictive, right? And that's, yeah, that scroll. Dopamine. It's all about the dopamine. <sighs> but does, yeah. but how, how does that, like, even, even that, right, that constant consumption of media, and if we go into, like, what is happening in the world right now, and how scary a place pretty much anywhere you are in the world right now doesn't really feel like a very stable time in global history, um, all of that consumption of all all of this messaging um, versus like, you know, how it used to, when we didn't have TVs and cell phones, and I, I can't even remember a time without a TV, um, but I, I do remember a time without cell phones. I, I feel like people weren't as anxiety, like, ridden as we are today and is that because we're just constantly bombarded with all of these threats mm -hmm. yes it's a choice i don't have a tv oh. no tv in my house and you have children I, too so how 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 as a parent because i think that's always a challenge right like how do you frame that like what is your um messaging to the kids about like because I know my kids do better with a why. If I just say no, it's it's never very good. <laughs> but if I yeah, say but... no, these are the rules because yada, 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 and I can explain it to them, they usually no. are a little more receptive. It's not about the rules. Okay. It's uh, about the outcome. So, um, I mean, we don't watch TV. And wait, I, my, my daughter is three and my son is eight. And they've never watched really TV. So, but of course, you know, there's WhatsApp and then there's, you know, Skype or Zoom or whatever. And uh, the, occasionally they're allowed to watch a little, you know, whatever, Tom and Jerry on their, on their phone, on the phone. And I explained to my son already several times that it's a one-way activity. And then when he watches it, that his creativity uh, it's not as active than when he has to think about what these things look like. And, and he, he, you know, it's like, and we had several conversations about it and he, he actually understands that. So he likes to listen to German, um, storybooks. Okay. And because, uh, you know, that's for me, it's sort of like an acceptable way of consuming media. Yeah. And because he's learning, a, he's learning that language and, 
And he said to me the other day, why am I allowed to do that? And like, why can't I watch TV and a movie? And I'm like, because you have to figure out when they say that she's the witch is riding on the yellow broom, you have uh -huh. to visualize that in your head. And yeah. then he said, well, I don't do such a good job with it. I'm like, what are you talking about? You're constantly making up games with numbers and rules with your friends and all these kind of things. And he's like, well, that's easier for me. Like, well, even more of a reason of why I don't want you to watch TV and so that you can work on that skill to visualize things of what they look like. So now granted, my kids go to a Waldorf school. So my, my daughter's in a Waldorf kindergarten and my son is in a Waldorf school. So mm. well, that philosophy is that way anyway, but it's the yeah. best decision that we've ever made because when he does watch something, like let's say I fly with him to Germany and he's on the plane for four hours and then we have a train or whatever. So, you know, we make a deal, gets to watch one thing. And I, I have observed, observed that he gets more aggressive afterwards. There's that dopamine, there's an addict, addictive behavior. And I pointed out to him, it's like, have you noticed like, you know, then honey, when you're like not watching anymore, how, how addictive it is and how cranky you get and how you yeah. like yell at me and all those kind of things. And he goes, hmm. So, you know, I'm wondering, I'd much rather have you play with your friend than um, watch t the, watch uh, watch something. And I love when I, my kids get together or when they, the whole class gets together, they're all playing and doing things. And when I see other kids, they're sitting there with their parents' phone We've been camping a couple of weeks. We're at this beautiful site in the Jordan Valley. And the kids are sitting there with their tablets. I'm like, what's wrong? You know, when we're in the water and doing whatever you do when you're camping and making bread and yeah, you know, uh, grilling and building the tent and, all, you know, hosing around. And I was like, that's sad. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so... It's an e not an easy decision. It's difficult because, of course, you want that free babysitter and we want to put them in front of the TV and there, there is actually some educational value to it. However, don't make the rules. So my, my bottom line here is explain to them what actually happens to them and yeah. why you don't want or why you think there's a better option. It's not about uh, those are the rules. It just doesn't help you grow in the best possible way. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I I don't. We have TV. I I keep fighting my family on tablets. They want to buy my five year old a tablet, and I'm like, absolutely not, no tablet. Um, but my mom watches my son, so I'm like, at Mimi's, you can have your tablet if that's what Mimi. She watches like three kids, <laughs> but but at mommy's house, there is no tablet. And right. you know, we we did. We took them on vacation for a week, and um, they brought their tablets with them because my mom was like, for the plane, yeah. But then if they know that it's there, every day is a battle to yeah, right. drop the tablet. And if I don't have like at home when we don't have that. It's not an argument to go to the park. It's not an argument to play in the backyard. It's not an argument to help with what the things that we're asking them to help with around the house because they're it's engaging, right? And they don't have the option to just sit there and zone out in front of the screen. <laughs> but no. I think I think the fact that your kids go to a school where that's kind of the um the their peers are also you know, uh, used to the same kind of roles, that does make it a lot easier as well. It does. It does, certainly helps. But I, I have the same conversation about video games. I say at the end of the day, when you play the video games, what do you have? A bunch of points. What can you do with those points? Yeah. Nothing. You have nothing in your hands. You have nothing to show for. You've created nothing. You didn't have an experience that really uplifted you. You're probably going to be cranky because you, you didn't get to the level that you wanted to go. Get to. Yeah. And I, I think it also like it definitely is affecting their brain development, right? Because they're not learning that, like you're saying, your son is learning that creativity of right. like how to imagine things and how to picture things and how to entertain himself and, and find ways to keep himself entertained, right? Like to find ways to occupy his own mind other than that. Um, Because all all of the the social media and everything like that is also just Cons like consumer culture and messaging and marketing and and it, it does have an influence of of how they see themselves in the world but i wanted to ask you about um your approach to looking at our ingrained survival strategies 
um, from our past experiences and how we work on it. I, I always call it like breaking the pattern, right? Because what the patterns from our childhood, though they were survival mechanisms then and were necessary for our own continuation <laughs> um, in adulthood, sometimes they don't necessarily match up with the reality that we're in now. And we have a lot of responses that are were once a coping skill or, or healthier for us that have become now like unhealthy or unuseful or destructive. Yes. Uh, so what's the question exactly? How, what do I? So, so yeah, like, so for the looking at those ingrained survival strategies, how, you know, your approach to that with like neuroemotional coaching can help replace those survival strategies with those healthier coping mechanisms. Is there like any, like, I know the coaching program is obviously a long process, but I'm sure just like every other modality, there's there's hopefully some some tips and tricks within there that we can all maybe try to apply. Yes. So I don't know that's so long necessarily because, you know, people are um, impatient and they want to get quick results. So I always start in the present. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot. So what are, what are, what are some of the things that you're str struggling with? <laughs> um, no, I'm about it. to have a baby in a, in like <laughs> a little over a month. Oh so, my God. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. So as as a, a mom of two and a business owner, um, for me, a big thing, I'm very much a people pleaser and a Pollyanna. Uh -huh. And um, I struggle with releasing control, which I've been working on as a business owner because you need to. Um, you but you know, even though I've worked on it a lot in the past couple of years, like the thought of actually stepping away and taking a maternity leave right now is scary. It, yeah, it feels like I'm excited about it. And part of me is like, really like, ah, oh, I could use this break and I'm going to do everything to put all these things in place so I could actually enjoy my break. And the other part of me is like, you're crazy. How do you walk away and not do everything? Um, but I'm trying to, you know, help soothe that voice because it's, you know, I have people on my team that that logically I know can help and do run things now. So there's no real threat. It's just a perceived threat of if I don't control the world, that something awful will happen. Oh, this is beautiful. Thank you for being so transparent. <laughs> yeah. I so appreciate it. Makes it so, you know, good for our listeners. Okay. So I always start in the present and I always start with an assertion like something that you want to be able to experience or something that you want to be able to hold. So and we always start with, most of the time I start with, I'm okay with. So in your case, it would be a positive assertion of uh, what you want to experience. So I'm okay with letting go or I'm okay with, you know, what's, what's the fear that is behind letting go of control? It's like making mistakes or things are falling apart or like, so, you know, people I'm okay. Gonna do it the same way. You know, exactly. <laughs> people, are, I'm okay with people messing up or I'm, I, I'm okay with, um, you know, being on the sidelines. Those are all activities that, that are part of you letting go that in the conversation that we have would get crystallized. Mm -hmm. And then I must attest you on it. Okay. I'm having you say the sentence. I'm okay with whatever it is. And in the muscle testing, it shows us in the system what emotional category is being triggered when you say that. And we're staying in the now. Okay. So let's say we, we use the acupuncture uh, um, chart for the, the, the emotional categories, you know, the five elements plus one. So we have basic anger, you know, anger, self-esteem, control, abandonment, shame. Here, uh, we're looking at that. And then basically the muscle testing will be able to pinpoint to one specific emotion. And then I will, it's called indexing for time. I will go, so when was the most original event when this was connected to that? And will always take us to some point in your consciousness. And most of the time will be in childhood, like one, two, or three, or whatever, or even in the womb. Um... And that is where we do the neutralization at that, not at the present. And then, so usually what happens is that, you know, when that's, 
neutralized and now the muscle testing will be strong, meaning you're holding on that, then we're looking to implement strategies. So, Jamie, you know, if you've been working on this for a while, but based on this realization that you just had, you know, what is it? What is one step that you could take in order to confirm what we just worked on? Okay. So that is the protocol of neuroemotional coaching because it goes so deep. It can go sometimes really quickly. I sometimes work with somebody, you know, I have a few sessions with them and all of a sudden it's like there's a total cleared space and they are mm -hmm. able to do things that they were never able to do before. Uh, but what I tell my clients, uh, not but, and what I tell my clients, one of the things that we use are these points up here, mm -hmm. the neurovascular points. And, you know, from history, we know when we sit like this and we rub those, it's, we also call them our worry points, that when you rub those neurovascular points, it's that your, your body will find some calmness. Okay. You know, so you can hold it and you can put your hand on your heart and it will calm you down. It will help you with your uh, parasympathetic nervous system. And then I'm a big fan because it also has some new um, science impl impl uh, implication is to do forgiveness mm. with self, other circumstance, and to do uh, gratefulness with, with yourself, with others, with circumstances in your work. Because when we do forgiveness, and there's a very specific way that I do it, um, once again, there's, it's a release technique. Your body that has this mental uh, construct about what you're judging about is connecting with your emotions. And then the emotions are like being directed. And I'm like, oh, I can let that go now. There will be will be calmness will come into your body, and we're talking about forgiveness of self, right? For whatever we're we're offering, forgiveness of self. I mean, you can do you can take that any way you want. I'm like, you know, I mean, so, I saw you know, you know, I I was actually abused as a child, and I was actually able at some point, and just before my father died, to to get to that complete state of forgiving everybody involved myself and everybody involved and for me it was it was an incredible experience because that was sort of like the point where i was able to let go of everything yeah. but you know i'm not uh everybody's where they are in their process and some people can say how could you possibly ever to uh that this is great uh so the forgiveness has this mainly starts with ourselves because i have the judgment and the expectation that i should be doing something differently that i should be exercising or i should be going to the gym or i should be um going to bed early or i should be yelling at my kid i can tell you we talked about this earlier in the podcast there's a lot of yelling going on here there's a lot of parents that are yelling at their kids there was always a lot of yelling going on here but right now and how could it not how well, could it not people it's are like, in chronic stress mode and, people and, are in and so they do it they they yell and they yell, you know, like, sometimes I'm like, okay, do I need to call anybody? Because it's really intense. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this judgment. How could I do it? I'm not a good mom. I'm failing my kids. So then there's the judgment of self. Um, for those that want to take it to the circum you know, circumstance or other people involved. But it's, it's always that you, I am forgiving. So even though you're, you're looking at other things, it's always about the judgments that you have. Yeah, uh, you know, with yourself. I right. think for me, uh, it's always been way harder to forgive myself for things than it is to forgive other people. And maybe that's just again because I'm an empath. Um, but when I when I do that work with my clients to release that um self blame, because I work with a lot of people with CPTSD and their core beliefs are generally I'm not good enough, um, I'm right, broken, right. or right, you know, exactly. I'll be alone in the world. They have a lot of that stuff coming up for them. And a lot of it is like the things that we blamed ourselves for as children. And a lot of those things were things that were beyond our control as children, right? Or they might have been things that we did that we're not so proud of when we were children, but we maybe didn't have the model or the resources or the knowledge to find a better solution to keep ourselves safe, right? Um, and right. I think that's super, super important, that that self-forgiveness aspect, because that's 
once that starts happening, that that inner critic voice starts to soften. And I feel like that's the biggest uh, thing that plagues a lot, like at least me and a lot of my clients, is that nagging voice that's just that really mean thing, that, that really mean voice that says all the things that are your, are your fears um, and your, your past traumas or maybe things that people even said to you when you were experiencing that or, or the messaging that you received. Right. And, and once we start to forgive ourselves and talk to ourselves, we start talking to ourselves kinder. And then that also helps us to break that chronic stress state because it, 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 this concept is always interesting to me that people most people I work with, and I'm sure it's probably the same for you, Dr. B, the things that they say to themselves, they probably would never, ever in a million years say to another living soul right. <laughs> in response to the same situation. Yes. Um, yeah. But but we we tend to just berate ourselves all day long about uh, every every little inconceivable mess up that, that happens. And some of them are big and some of them are small. But when you're constantly yelling at yourself, you know, um, that affects your nervous system regulation. And that also affects how you show up for your kids and everyone else. Like I know for me um, with this pregnancy, like I don't sleep for for anything. Third trimester is the worst. Um, and even this morning I was, I was yelling at my son for not wanting to put his socks on, which he has sensory issues. So I know better than to yell at him for not wanting to put his socks on. But I was just like, two hours of sleep, both the kids have been up since 5 a.m. And I was just at my breaking point and I did recalibrate and apologize. But yeah, when, when we're not taking care of ourselves or we're in a chronic stress state, we are way more likely to respond um, outside of what our ideal self. Uh, our two. <laughs> right. But, but Jamie, you said the magic word. The magic words are that you recalibrate it. Yeah. And then you went and apologized. Okay, because that is often not what happened to us. There was no apology. Okay, it wasn't like, oh, there was something that I didn't do right. And, uh, you know, but there's something that's wrong with you. And then the distinction between the being and the doing. You know, that what I'm doing, my behavior is not acceptable, but that my beingness, you know, my beingness is whole and complete. So I think that's super, super important to keep that in mind. We're not perfect. We're not looking for perfection. No. We're, we're looking to um, at corrective behaviors. We're looking at, can I take the feedback? Can I, uh, can I course correct? Can I, you know, uh, can I implement? Yesterday I was uh, talking with somebody and I was saying, oh, you know, I was just not prepared. And then and the, the response was, oh, that sounds like a good, uh, you know, patriarchal, response like you know you know we women we're always so critical and i was like i'm not sure it's like you know sometimes maybe that's true but you know i i didn't plan my time as well that i could i was just you know being self-reflective about the whole situation and so that i can course correct i want to say something about that inner voice and inner critic mm. if i may yes please so in my coaching training i we had to read the book it was called taming your gremlin by richard carson you might know it and no, I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> you write that down. It's good. It's a great book. Okay. And I took that. I took his concept and I I developed it further. And I, um, if anybody's listening and they they want to know more about it, I can. You know, you can also go on my YouTube channel or my website. There's you know blog that I wrote about several several of them. But the idea is that um, he took this this inner voice and he called it the gremlin, and, and he look to see how we can deal with that gremlin. And most of us, we try to wrestle with the gremlin. Go away, I don't want you, you know, shut up, I, you know, go away already. And it's like never works because the gremlin is always, you know, they are very strong. And so I said, what is the gremlin? The gremlin is really a composite, mm -hmm. a composite of the things that we, situation that we experience where the emotions were like, mm, or the culture and the norms, the intergenerational trauma, all that stuff together. And the gremlin shows up, it has a very distinct job. Most of the time it's to protect ourselves when we when we step outside the comfort zone. Yeah. So, and the book talks about this as well. So he has a couple exercises and he says, get to know your gremlin. Give it a name, age, favorite saying, uh, and a few other things. And then I added things like, what if you loved your gremlin? What would the gremlin say if you just went to the gremlin and say, you know, I really love you and I really appreciate you for being there. 
Uh, and what, and I, I did this too, it's not in the book. I at some point decided to give that inner critic, the gremlin, a different job. I mm-hmm. said, you know what, buddy? You don't need to protect me anymore. When I'm really good. What I want you to do is I want to take this energy that you have. And when I'm scared to do something new, I want you to hold my hand and encourage me and to cheer me on. And so that I can do that. So my gremlin, uh, which was a big, you know, Germanish, Germanian, uh, Valkyr kind of like goddess kind of person that was like invincible, didn't need anybody. I can do everything myself. Turned into this strong support of, I can do this. Uh, you know, I'm helping you, but not in the destructive kind of way, but yeah. rather in the supportive kind of way. So mm-hmm. when we work with the gremlin, start with observing. Start to get to know the gremlin by asking a bunch of questions. And like I said, I'm happy to send that. People want that. And then um, love the gremlin. And then finally assign the gremlin a different job. And then you're going to have a completely different experience with that voice inside of you uh, because it's, it's, it's going to be pretty quiet, which is, which is what we want. Well, I, I think that... That, that reminds me a lot. I've never read that book, but it reminds me a lot of like the work that we do in IFS, right? In internal family systems and uh, reparenting our inner child. And um, I've kind of done similar work, but I it, well, I didn't call it my gremlin. I have a, uh, my most aggressive part of self is like 16 year old me. By that point in my childhood, I was just like, I'm ready to annihilate the world. Um, and she was very, very destructive. <laughs> Um, but she also like, it was a protection, right? Like it was right. very much a protection, but because of all the negative feedback I got about how I behaved in that time period of my life, when that's how I was coping with all the trauma I was experiencing, when she would start to get upset and I would feel that like anger, or frustration bubbling up, I'd push it down, I'd push it down, I'd push it, And I ignored her for years and years and years, but they, like you were saying about the gremlin, it's a protective part, right? There's a reason that part is coming out. That part for me was coming out because she was like, you need boundaries. You are too selfless and you keep winding up putting yourselves in bad situations and we're in a bad situation because you can't say no and you aren't prioritizing us, right? And once I reassigned her a role of like, hey, okay, I need you to let me know what the boundary is. That's important. But we need to work on partnering with some other parts of self here so that we can then address it in a way that isn't like flying off the handle, right? Like your job is to alert us to the boundary violations. And then you can let adult Jamie have a nice conversation with the person about, you know, how we're going to set that boundary or what the consequences will be if they don't follow through on on, on if they don't respect my boundaries, right? Um, and that really helped me a lot to just feel a lot more regulated in my day to day because it wasn't this constant battle between the guilt of saying no and the you need to take care of yourself that we're just constantly arguing about all the time. So that that reminds me very, very much of that. But uh, Dr. B, I know you have to go soon. So before you leave, the last question I want to ask you um, is what does being good enough mean to you as a clinician, as a trauma survivor, what does being good enough mean to you? Wow. Such a, such a powerful question. So for me, being good enough means that I get to experience myself in my body as a soul on this planet and explore all the things that are available to me and that are possible that I can manifest my dreams, that I can, um, um, that I'm allowed to screw up uh, and to get up and to continue, that I get to just uh, live my best life possible. So that's for me personally, but it's like for me personally and professionally, it's like, I don't know that there's a difference. And and for me professionally, it's like that I get to assist other people to do that. I am, I feel so incredibly honored and so I couldn't, I mean, like, it took me forever to figure out what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I, you know, I didn't even, it didn't take that long for me to figure out, uh, because I've been doing this for 25 years, is to be able to assist people 
to um, people who want to heal their trauma. Um, they find their way to me, uh, whether that's in a corporate setting. You know, I coach people that have 5,000 people under them and they have just been, they have been traumatized just as much as, you know, yep. the people that are struggling to survive. And, and to weave that into the corporate coaching conversation, uh, I feel so blessed because I think my whole M mission is that when we heal, or as to the degree that we heal, and healing is a big word, we will create a better planet for all. It's like we are in the state that we're in right now with all the horrors that are going on on the planet is because we've really failed to um, to heal our traumas and we've yeah. just basically passed it on. So that's uh, that's what it means to me. It's like that we that we continue to do the work, that we elevate to do the work, that that we we um we don't beat ourselves when we haven't done well enough or when we fall in a hole ourselves that we just pick ourselves up we get the assistance that we need and then we keep going yeah. uh, and that we're open um to new ways and that we love ourselves we love ourselves for all that we are and for all that we're not yeah it's i, I think that's part of the that's the most beautiful part is like i love myself flaws and all because it's not, you know, I think a lot of us get in that mindset of I'll love myself when and I'm never going to be perfect at everything in my life. And there are things that I am amazing at and there are things that my brain is not wired for. And I, I think that's a beautiful um, point to make because when we can accept ourselves like, OK, but th this is a flaw for me, but that's also OK. And I'm still a worthy human. And maybe that's not a flaw that you even want to fix. You know, I don't particularly care that I'm not a morning person. <laughs> I'll never be a morning person. Um, but okay. But, yeah. Uh, so Dr. B, for anyone who is looking for corporate coaching or individual coaching, where can they find you? Where can they reach out? What should they be following to hear more from you? Great question. So uh, go for sure, my website, uh, clearintentions.net. And um, or LinkedIn, uh, Barbara Schwark or Clear Intentions International. And for people that want to follow me, I invite you to you know follow me on Instagram or LinkedIn or Facebook or on my YouTube channel. I put out regular content on my um, on my YouTube channel and on my website. I have a lead magnet and. If you are interested in learning some strategies on how to deal with your emotions and how to deal with your triggers and to get unstuck, and so things that you can do on your own, you can download it there. We just need your email. And then, right. yeah, I'm all about service. So, and on the website, there's probably over 100 blogs um, that people can read. But if somebody's really interested um, to, to check this out, to find out more about neuroemotional coaching, Mention that you watch this particular episode, and uh, when you book your intro session, I will add some time to it, and so that instead of having a half hour, we uh, we have like forty five minutes to an hour to really explore um, what your needs are, or what you know, how I can assist you if it makes sense. That's a really beautiful gift, Doctor B. Thank you so much. My Thank you pleasure. for being on today. Um, I just want to remind our listeners that you are good enough. Till next time, guys. Thank you for listening to Good Enough with the Trauma Therapist. We appreciate you listening. While our host may provide some personal and professional advice, we want to remind you that this show is for entertainment purposes only. Each individual situation is unique. And good enough is not a substitute for mental health treatment. If you need a therapist and are located in New York or Missouri, feel free to reach out to us at liendr.com or resilient-mo.com.